Today, many look back at Sega and see their efforts to prolong the life of the Mega Drive as a key reason the Saturn was undermined. I mean, these two launched a month apart in Japan. Why buy a new 32-bit machine when you can plug this into your 16-bit one? Because this one doesn't have Panzer Dragoon. But Nintendo were very much planning to do the same thing. The Super Nintendo CD was infamously so far into development that in the year 2020, an actual prototype for a 2-in-1 Super Nintendo and CD system sold for £230,000 at auction. And this was the PlayStation. Of course, once the deal with Sony flopped, this would become the PlayStation. While Nintendo's efforts to power up the Super Nintendo via hardware add-ons never surfaced, they had a few tricks, both coming from a little place called the United Kingdom. In 1994, British studio Rareware had the idea to cheat full 3D visuals on the Super Nintendo by converting pre-rendered 3D CGI into 2D sprites. An astonishing amount of work and compromise, but the results speak for themselves. Donkey Kong Country still looks great. However, one year earlier in 1993, Organos Software achieved something far more impressive. Full 3D on the Super Nintendo in real time. No asterisk. Well, apart from one, the Super FX chip. The team at Organaut developed the chip themselves, and while not many games would utilize it, the perception was still enough to make it seem like the Super Nintendo had no need for hardware add-ons. It could do all this with just a game cartridge. While the Mega Drive needed the 32X for Doom, the Super Nintendo could handle it natively, kinda. New effects were unleashed, like sprite scaling and stretching in Yoshi's Island. The Super FX chip was a game changer, and it all began with Star Wing or Star Fox as you most likely know it. Nintendo EAD collaborated with Organaut to deliver a fully 3D, on-rail shooter unlike anything else on the market, let alone consoles. The Super Nintendo was drawing full-on polygons, and even today, there's something very charming about this art style, even if the frame rate is messy. Star Fox was incredible, both in its technical accomplishments and its gameplay. What was a graphical showcase would become a major Nintendo franchise with games spanning across every single console generation. But it didn't actually start here. In fact, Nintendo and Organaut had already partnered to do something far more impressive than 3D on the Super Nintendo with a special chip. They did 3D without any hardware tricks on the Game Boy. This is X, released in 1992 exclusively in Japan. Organaut have an unfortunate history of their Nintendo projects being shelved. Star Fox 2 was 95% complete before being locked away until 2017, where it would finally release on the Super Nintendo Classic. X likewise was fully translated and ready to ship worldwide. It would have been known as Lunar Chase. In fact, as part of 2020's Giga Leak, Lunar Chase is out there in the dark corners of the internet. We're using a fan translation today, but Nintendo do have a fully localized version in their vaults. They could release it whenever they want to. X may not be in the Star Fox series, but its core gameplay and what it technically achieves is absolutely cut from the same cloth. You still have a commander that briefs you before each mission, you still fly through on-rails corridors, and you still shoot stuff. But of course, we're running natively on 8-bit monochrome hardware here, so the results aren't quite as flattering. But I think it's still easy to admire how impressive this is. This is 3D on the Game Boy. In fact, X does something Star Fox wouldn't do into its successor, Full Range 3D. Yeah, not just meticulously crafted on rails visuals, but full explorable environments. And this is the bulk of the game. There's a couple of sections where you navigate through on rails mazes, and these feel and handle exactly like Star Fox. But most of the time, you'll find yourself driving around freely, doing objectives. This may all seem like a giant empty space where everything looks the same, but it's actually quite intelligently designed. In addition to your main view, there's a map right here showing what quadrant you're in. And right here, there's a compass showing which way you're facing. With both of these tools, you can ignore the primary view and navigate entirely using these maps. But merging all these viewpoints together, and you have a setup that's actually aged pretty well for what it is. It's absolutely of its time, but once you're playing, that goes to the back of your mind. All levels take place on this one base, and you'll have different objectives like go to Area 7 to get the Power Crystal and take it to the silo, or defend your bases for a bunch of robots. It's all about exploring and becoming familiar with your surroundings, and for 3D on the Game Boy, it works remarkably well. Yeah, the frame rate's choppy, but once you're in the zone, you'll be going from one area to another, driving into bunkers to change your equipment, shooting down enemies, and using all the tools you have as if they were second nature. It's more than just impressive technically, it's really good. Although the tutorial lasts way too long. Star Fox at least had the courtesy to make it an option. 
I like these ramps too. You can dynamically go from a land tank to a fully operational flight mode simply by driving off them. This kind of transition actually isn't too far from the chicken walker. There's a lot of Star Fox 2 lurking in here. Clearly, the game's more graphically impressive during its flight sections, and that's probably why they became the core focus of Star Fox. But the condensed explorable base feels very at home on the Game Boy. They didn't have to develop a dozen uniquely crafted monochrome levels, and instead hone their focus on just the one, and I think that really paid off. It's a very focused game. What X lacked was character. The commander's one of the only ones you'll talk to, and he's no Commander Pepper. It makes it a little hard to connect with the story, and clearly that's another thing they'll up their focus on with Star Fox. Even though you fly an Arwing, the characters are front and center. Beyond being the origins for the tech and gameplay of Star Fox, there's another major first for X. This was the debut project for composer Kazumi Totaka. You may know him for Totaka's song. This is the very first game it ever appeared in. During Mission 4, your objective is to blast open a building with a missile and rescue an abducted professor. There's a bunch of different buildings, and most of them are empty, but there's a chance that one of them will spawn a human sprite. When you drive into this, you'll either see this screen, which means you found the professor, or this screen, meaning you found a fake professor. And if you stay on the fake one for 40 seconds, you'll hear this. This was the start of one of the most interesting Nintendo legacies. Hidden in every game Tataka composed was this simple 90-note melody, and there's some games where it still hasn't been discovered. Over the years, X's legacy hasn't gone unnoticed. This is a first-party Nintendo game, and the tunnel theme made its way into Super Smash Bros. Brawl. In fact, it's still there in Ultimate. And while X would grow into Star Fox, that didn't stop an actual X sequel coming to DSiWare. Now bear with me, it's called something different everywhere. In the States, this is X-Scape, in Japan, it was X-Returns, and in Europe, it was 3D Space Tank. Okay. This also has a theme in Smash, by the way. At this point, Orgonaut Software weren't a thing anymore. In 2004, many employees would join Rocksteady Games. Yeah, the Batman Arkham guys. But Dylan Cuthbert, who was a major part of Star Fox, went on to create Q Games. In fact, as Q Games, they've returned to Star Fox a few times to make Star Fox Command, and Star Fox 64 3D. You may also know them for the Pixel Junk games. Anyway, at this point, Q Games is basically the successor to Orgonaut, and in partnership with Nintendo, they return to the game that started this whole adventure. I suppose the premise was lost on a lot of us, not really knowing the story of X, but it actually does an outstanding job going back to its roots. We reviewed this way back in 2010, and gave it a 9 out of 10. It's gone back to the deliberate ground section focus, rather than the heavy on-rails design of Star Fox, but everything is so much smoother, more stylish, and more varied. You'll be forgiven for letting this one pass you by, but as a Star Fox fan, you really should give it a go. Even though the actual DSi store went down in 2017, it's still live on the 3DS eShop alongside most DSi software. The early to mid-90s was an incredibly interesting time for visuals. 16-bit machines were achieving things they absolutely shouldn't be capable of. But tucked away exclusively in Japan was a game doing all this on an 8-bit, portable Game Boy, with the exact same power and tools as any other game on the platform. X is a remarkable accomplishment. Oh hey, you watched the whole thing? Thank you! I love doing little deep dives into lesser-known Nintendo games, especially those with a legacy tied to much bigger franchises. We did The Frog For Whom The Bell Tolls and a Secret Ties Link's Awakening, and now X with his Star Fox ties. And the interesting thing with X is because there's an official localization in Nintendo's vaults, there's a real chance that this could finally release as Lunar Chase, officially, with Game Boy Online rumors circling around everywhere. So hopefully this is going to be more than just a one-off, and maybe you guys can even play X or Lunar Chase for yourself in the future. Please do it, Nintendo. I love doing these, and if you like them too, then let us know in the comments, and we'll do even more of them. But until then, go to that subscribe button and view us on a Game Boy, but somehow in 3D, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Oh, what?